Welcome everybody to today's FDTD GO16 Applications webinar. Today we're pleased to have Ariel Cohen from the WFO in Topeka, Kansas to lead our discussion on convective initiation. Go ahead to the next slide. And just to go over some protocol before we begin, uh, all of these are recorded and they're available on the visit web pages at the link given here. Also, we're looking for speakers. We actually have a slot available for March 21st or actually any time after that. So if you have an interesting topic you'd like to share with the community, just let us know. Send either myself, Dan Vikas, or Scott Lindstrom an email. Uh, next slide. And just to go over some protocol, we'll have approximately 20 minutes for our speaker, after which we'll have a question and an answer period. And uh, we'll be done by 1830 UTC. Uh, remember, do not press hold. And also remember to mute when you're not speaking. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ariel. Hi everyone, this is Ariel Cohen at National Weather Service Topeka. Um, Dan, can you hear me okay? Volume yes, working all no right? Yes, no problem. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for having me, everyone. It's uh, great to be on this call today. I know with winter weather advisories from southwest Texas to the St. Louis area, severe weather is not necessarily right at the forefront of our minds right now, but we're right around uh, the corner from severe weather season. We already have a tornado watch from Louisiana today, so not too much longer until we're dealing with deep moist convection uh, affecting a larger portion of the CONUS. So we're going to be talking today about how we can use some of the revolutionizing GO-16 imagery to leverage the diagnostic process for the ingredients that lead up to the development of deep moist convection that has potential major impacts on, on life and uh, society property as well. I'm going to be focusing in particular on the necessary conditions of moisture, lift, and instability, and how we can use GO-16 data in order to understand how these ingredients are coming together um, in terms of anticipating severe weather. Um, specifically, the integration of these data into the scientific process for anticipating the development of this potentially high-impact weather will be critical for enhancing the spatiotemporal uh, accuracy and precision of uh, any tasks uh, pertaining to impact-based decision support services in the realm of convective initiation um, implications. So we're going to go through in this presentation a couple of uh, examples of how we can use GO-16 imagery to look at these ingredients to come together. And we're going to look at two specific cases um, focused on portions of Kansas. Um, one is going to be this first case where we have a weak forcing for ascent regime that I'm going to be showing over here. Um, you can see in the top left panel over here very modest mid-level height falls uh, preceding a mid-level wave coming southeast out of portions of the north central United States beginning to overlay this box area here in the central US, US where we have appreciable moisture return extending northward to a boundary, a relatively diffuse boundary, but one nonetheless extending from southwest Wisconsin into southwest Kansas. Very humid conditions lie south of the boundary with dew points well into the 70s across portions of central and eastern Kansas. Given the weak forcing for ascent regime in place with the very modest height falls overspreading the moist and very unstable boundary layer, the atmosphere is going to be acting much more deliberately. We're going to see these pieces of ascent come together in terms of fostering the development of deep moist convection and proximity to this boundary. And every one of these steps we're going to be able to see come together with GO-16 imagery. Let's look at the convective outlook that was leading up to the severe weather event. You can see the Storm Prediction Center had a very well-placed enhanced area from portions of east central and northeast Kansas into far west central Indiana, driven primarily by wind and hail probabilities with SIG areas for both of those, as well as some low end tornado threat extending from, say, the Concordia, Kansas area into north central and central Illinois. Looking at the observed sounding from Topeka at 20Z, this is a special uh, sounding that Topeka Forecast Office released here, 20Z, and you can see relatively veered flow through the boundary layer, quite light, but with increasing speeds with height above ground. But most notably, I want to show the very thick buoyancy layer that we have extending above the LFC throughout, a deep layer of the troposphere driven by very moist conditions in the boundary layer characterized by surface dew points around into the middle 70s. Um, the sounding was containing a very appreciable amount of surface based cape, pushing well over 
5,000 joules per kilogram with ample mixed layer cape as well. However, noticeable tapping at the base of an elevated mixed layer that overspread that rich boundary layer moisture, and you can see that capping well evidenced in this particular sounding over here. So with a weak forcing for ascent regime, as well as the antecedent capping in place, the process by which deep moist convection were, is going to develop in this particular case is going to be relatively slow. However, the timing of the deep moist convection, as well as the location of primary impact, is going to be absolutely critical to pinpointing down to enhance our IDSS of very high impact weather, given the very large amount of uh, conditional instability in place, supporting a very high conditional severe weather threat. So let's look at how we can use conceptual models of convective supporting processes to understand exactly um, where we can anticipate some convective development threat. We're going to start out by looking at the relationship between mid-level speed maxima, how we can use water vapor imagery to diagnose their present locations and associated lift, which could have an influence exerted on the severe weather threat. So let's consider a straight jet streak, as you can see in this example over here with a four-quadrant model. Um, within the entrance region of this jet streak have the thermally direct circulation that's going to be enhancing upward motion trend and, and related upward motion I should say, rather, upward moisture transport, as well as lift within the right entrance region and subsidence within the left entrance region of that same speed max. This is going to have a tendency of generating enhanced moisture within the right entrance region, as well as substance related drying the left entrance region over here, which is going to preferentially spread downstream as parcels move through the jet streak. Remember, the parcel motion is going to be through the jet streak as the phase speed of the actual jet streak is going to be slower than the rate at which the air is moving through um, the actual jet streak and disturbance itself. So it's going to have a tendency of casting enhanced moisture downstream along the um, right flank in this particular case for westerly flow or south, south flank of that jet streak, uh, pretty much masking any influences downstream within the exit region of that jet streak with a dry air um, plume being cast downstream on the north side or in the, um, of that particular jet streak in this example over here. So with the parcels moving through the jet streak, we end up getting this couplet effectively between moistening and drying that takes place. So we can use water vapor imagery to diagnose for areas where we have um, this ascent that's being driven by the ageostrophic circulations accompanying the jet streak. And where we see these couplets take shape, we can understand that some perturbation exists within the troposphere to potentially enhance ascent in order to provide the impetus for convective initiation. Now, this is an example of a straight jet streak. If we were to have curvature in the flow, as I show in this example over here, that will have a tendency of skewing this couplet. Um, but otherwise, for the straight jet streak, we know that that moistening is going to be, um, and that, um, or I should say rather that the axis of the jet streak will tend to be on the flank of the broadly cyclonic flow maximum, so that we're able to kind of get some idea between the relationship of these interfaces and the enhanced mid-level wind speeds that could potentially be supporting stronger deep shear in place. And so, again, that's, there's an overall skewness to that couplet as we have more curvature in the flow. So let's actually look at this, ex, uh, this uh, exact example. Um, as you can see, as I loop through mid-level water vapor imagery, remember, Go16 Go 16 imagery, we're able to look at the mid-levels in different particular parts. Remember, we have lower um, water vapor, lower level water vapor imagery, mid-level water vapor imagery, and as well as upper level as well. So we're able to kind of get an idea in this particular case of mid-level jet streaks and their um, implications on um, moistening, um, related descent, as well as drying to get some idea what lift is happening and what perturbations could be enhancing convective potential. So looking for this particular case across Kansas, you can see in the sequence of slides this couplet between drying across portions of the Dakotas and greater moistening farther to the south in advance of that particular jet streak. And you can see through the progress of the day at around 20Z, the well-defined couplet in between moistening and drying accompanying this perturbation with, let me go back um, a little bit over here, uh, these passive tracer moisture indicators uh, from water vapor imagery highlighting the axis of the speed max that's crossing portions of uh, Nebraska, potentially glancing Kansas as well, um, that will have some influence on the deep shear profile supporting uh, robust convection across parts of Kansas. But a very big picture, but very big point to take away here is that that couplet between drying and moistening representing the presence of this particular perturbation is well removed from the higher buoyancy that we had sampled from the Topeka sounding and proximity to that boundary extending northeast, southwest through Kansas. But perhaps the approach of peripheral ascent related to this disturbance would face uh, favorably with diurnal heating maximum to support convective development, although it's going to be very subtle in this case. 
Let's take a look at an act that at the sounding in more detail where we have weak forcing for ascent. And I'm going to indicate that by a convergence implication here uh, at the base of the boundary layer. We know using this conceptual model concept that um, we could have enough lift to take place through a deep enough layer, uh, perhaps diurnally, uh, diurnally enhanced PBL circulations phasing with the um, antecedent boundary with just enough ascent in order to get initial parcels to their LCLs in order to foster initial shallow convective development. I kind of indicate that here with this uh, tiny little cloud here right around the LCL. But major problem here. We know that that capping inversion, that capping layer over here, that region of relatively warmer air aloft at the base of the ML will have a tendency of suppressing vertical motion, preventing those initial parcels from getting all the way to their LFCs, such that the initial related cloud material becomes orphaned, and we end up with these orphan anvils that take place as uh, pretty much these uh, branches of upward motion um, are intercepting that stable layer and prevent a deeper convection from evolving. However, with time, as we have these orphan anvils uh, take shape and potentially be affected by the flow once the failed convective attempts actually take place, that will nevertheless have some effect on modifying that capping layer. In particular, the enhanced vertical motion fields, evaporation that occur around those what we'll I'll call failed cumulus congestus clouds, will have a tendency to cool and moisten that capping layer, bringing that environmental profile temperature curve farther to the left with the, uh, with the dew point curve farther to the right, which could potentially support later generations of convective initiation or render them more successful, potentially, followed by these repeated orphan anvil um, attempts as the cap is weakened and the effects of entrainment are lessened. And eventually, we could potentially having parcels getting to their LFCs um, with enough erosion of the antecedent capping, and potentially even small collections of parcels can reach the LFCs. But given the very weak magnitude of the ascent, potentially relatively shallow, and just a few parcels or small collections of parcels in this weak forcing for ascent regime getting to their LFCs, that would have a tendency of supporting only narrow poultry updrafts. And this is really a symptom of the lacking um, of robust ascent across the region. Furthermore, the narrow, narrowness of the convergence zone of the boundary layer could have a tendency of... Uh, of having parcels detrain from that upward motion circulation, if it's very narrow, it's very possible a lot of parcels will effectively escape that narrow zone of ascent and pretty much result in failed convection attempts. Um, so these narrow poultry updrafts are going to be susceptible, um, given how exposed they are, for instance, um, how much a, a lack of self-sustaining, robust updraft systems with the wheat forcing first cent regime. They're going to be very susceptible to dry air entrainment associated with the AML, as well as any water loading processes, uh, precipitation drag that will have a tendency for them to fail in these initial stages where they're relatively exposed and unsheltered without a more robust upward motion signal um, in this particular case. And the result will still be orphan anvils, but those that extend above that capping inversion layer but are not quite at that point where we have the self-sustainability from an actual um, updraft mass flux perspective with a more organized self-sustaining system. But these initial deeper convective attempts and associated plumes are going to be depositing oh, hydrodynamic yeah. perturbation pressures throughout the vertical column, specifically at their flanks and the middle levels of that particular initial updraft, which can dynamically enhance ascent once we get those initial poultry updrafts going and they get a little bit deeper. These individual perturbation pressures can phase with one another if they're occurring all around the same place to really support dynamic lifting that augments the a antecedent background lift tied to the initial surface boundary that has otherwise weak background forcing for ascent. And so the phasing of all these dynamic perturbation pressure gradient forces as we have these initial repeated updraft attempts take shape that all could potentially superimpose combined with the effects of a mitigated um, dry air entrainment from weakening of the capping as well as moistening within that capping layer can all potentially promote later generations of con deep convection becoming much more successful. And steep low-level lap rates can have a tendency of amplifying this process as well. And GOES-16 imagery provides the details on this process that can go directly into messaging. So let's go to this example across the Topeka CWA, which we have outlined here in Cyan. As you can see, evidence of the agitated Q fields in proximity to that boundary extending from between Salina and Clay Center all the way towards the St. Joseph region. You can actually see as I go through this loop, coiling of the Q 
cumulus congestive fields west of Clay Center, where we might have a mesoscale convergence zone being enhanced by perhaps a weak meso low evolving southwest of Clay Center, Kansas. You can see we have agitated Q fields all along that boundary, to the north of which more stable laminar looking billow clouds are present in the Seneca area. To the south of the boundary, you can see just a broader field of cumulus clouds, less well organized compared to those in existence in proximity to that boundary. Now, notice around Clay Center, these initial updraft attempts get a little bit deeper, but we get, you can see one little anvil sprout off just east of Clay Center. I'm going to highlight that area now. This is where, as forecasters, we can start to look at this area as targeted, getting closer to those um, repeated convective attempts, potentially uh, breed a deeper convective, self-sustaining convective plume that could give rise to actual thunderstorm activity as we see those initial orphan anvils take shape, especially when they occur in proximity to each other and we get the phasing dynamic lifting that occurs with perturbation pressures. You can see we're getting deeper convection, but it's still orphaning. You can see these deeper towers southeast of Clay Center circled here. We're getting some attempt, but it's still failing, as I talked about earlier. The effects of a water loading, the effects of a dry air entrainment are all going to be detrimental until we get enough of these initial updrafts. And you can see even here with a radar image that I show, let me see if I pause on this slide over here, hardly anything on radar. We can already be targeting our messaging that this is a focused area of increasing convective development well before we even get any radar returns by just using this very high spatiotemporal spatiotemporal resolution satellite imagery. And with time, you can see these updraft attempts tend to phase all together at the same time and same place to really enhance a dynamic lifting. Again, even before we see any radar returns, we're able 30 minutes and even an hour out to be able to message such information as growing threat area south of Clay Center, as you can see over here, um, where we get these, the, these processes come together to really support self-sustaining robust updraft draft systems. And eventually that did give rise to sustained deep moist convection and even with these overshooting tops and many other things that we can see evident once the convection is going with the corresponding radar image over here. But it took all of those um, initial weakening of the capping, um, phasing hydrodynamic perturbation pressure gradient forces to all come together. And we can see all that in GO-16 imagery. I'm going to show an example of a slide over here with a mesoscale discussion that preceded this particular event talking about some of the concerns concerns that we had um, with the likelihood of a watch issuance, but uh, some uncertainty in the timing as the forcing first scent is weak, but how these initial updraft pulsations along the zone of convergence detected in GO-16 imagery, imagery are critical in terms of assessing the subsequent threat for storm development. We can use this information to understand how the boundary layer is evolving. I'm going to mention also uh, what we've ex been experimenting with here at the National Weather Service in Topeka, this enhanced short-term weather outlook to really get ahead of of, um, or get information now to enhance IDSS, provide some precision in the timing and location of anticipated storm formation before the warnings go out, before the storms even form, and how we can use this background science as the basis and all the GO-16 imagery as observational support for highlighting an area of threat. Now, this is a different example in October um, that I'm showing over here, but the same general idea can be used in terms of pretty much bridging that watch outlook phase to the warning phase before the storms even form. Now, I'm going to quickly go through another case over here. Um, this is one where forcing for ascent in late October across portions of Kansas was a little bit stronger with a wave, higher amplitude wave, um, exerting influence over portions of the central United States along its eastward track with, for late October, appreciable Gulf moisture return, at least part partially modified Gulf, Gulf moisture trajectories extending into parts of the lower Missouri Valley region. You can see as the forcing for ascent was moving up to the area, SPC was high, highlighting enhanced risk for severe storms driven by a combination of wind and hail probabilities um, extending from central Kansas to the Texas Panhandle region with slight caliber wind and hail probabilities extending all the way through northeast Kansas into southeast Nebraska. I um, want, want to show one thing over here, Dodge City sounding this morning, showing a very, very uh, modest lapse rate at best throughout the mid-levels of the atmosphere. Um, not too warm, but quite moist conditions in the boundary layer in this particular sounding. Now, I want to show between a 12Z Dodge City sounding 
and the 18Z Dodge City sounding, how much evolution took place in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. That is pure mid-level lapse rate EML advection being shown right here. That's right in the lapse rate tendency equation, uh, pretty much advection of lapse rates. You can see that tremendous influence of that advection term there on really steepening the mid-level lapse rates in, in six hours from 12Z to 18Z. But how can we use GO-16 energy to see this come to life? Well, we can use a lower-level water vapor imagery in order to address this. And I'm going to show the lower-level water vapor imagery between those times, I should say rather pretty much around 18Z, um, showing the trajectory of this dry plume indicative of the EML, a little bit of mixed layer, that was overspreading that moist boundary layer coming all the way through west central, central Kansas, extending eventually into western part of the Topeka CWA. That is a critical signal for being able to understand how the mid-level lapse rate profile will vary with time as that EML is advected over the region. So even without seeing that sounding change, we're able to use this lower level water vapor imagery critically so to see how the lapse rate profile might adjust and become more conducive for supporting greater degrees of buoyancy and more robust convective threat. Now that's all occurring atop um, a number of things I want to talk about in very short order about how the planetary boundary layer moisture regime is going to be evolving with these events of return moisture, um, especially as we go into late October when we have antecedent cold air across parts of the central U.S. that can be quickly replaced at times by moistening. The initial, um, the initial result is going to be a lot of potential widespread cloudiness, mixing clouds as that moist air is advancing into cool air. It's gonna, that interesting cool air is going to have a tendency of cooling that moisture influx to its dew point. We're going to get mixing clouds, fog, stratus, drizzle, and that really all reinforces static stability within the planetary boundary layer. We can see billow clouds that will lie orthogonal to the low-level shear, other laminar-looking cloud structures, stratus, wave clouds, versus the HCRs that lie along low-level shear vectors that are going to be more indicative of lesser stability in the boundary layer, greater amounts of boundary layer instability, and the potential for surface-based effective info layer. So I want to get back to this cold air um, process reinforcing the static stability of the planetary boundary layer. It takes time for that antecedent cold air to really accept that moistening process to take place in order to support greater mixing within that returning moist layer supporting surface-based effective inflow. Um, that requires diabetic surface heating, uh, sensible heat fluxes to the surface as well as surface warm advection, surface layer warm advection, in order to support that transition from a cool, stable moist layer to one that is going to be more unstable supporting surface-based convection with a moisture influx. Um, I'm going to go through some visible imagery to kind of highlight this process and everything we can use in GO-16 imagery, especially with the enhanced spatial temporal resolution, in order to diagnose the evolving PBL transitions. You can see across central and western Kansas and northeast Kansas a whole wide variety of regimes in this image over here. I'm going to focus on how we can use these cloud indicators as, an, um, as a diagnostic for the amount of mixing taking place in the returning moist layer up to this boundary that extended northeast southwest from north central Kansas to west central Kansas, you can see to the north of the boundary these stable laminar looking billow clouds um, across uh, portions of northwest Kansas. You can see within the moistening return uh, moistening I should say moist layer that's returning northward, you can see some of these billow cloud structures, but because we have diurnal heating occurring amidst then there's going to be a tendency for static stability to be reduced, causing these turbulent eddies to superimpose with the with these billow cloud structures, resulting in some curvilinearity um, to these particular structures as boundary layer static stability is reduced. Now, with time, um, you can see that as the degree of mixing within the moist layer increases diurnally, that's going to have a tendency of supporting more turbulent or textured appearances to the cloud structures on the warm side of that boundary. And you can see these textured, more um, convective-looking appearance to the open warm sector moist layer uh, config cloud configurations, as you can see throughout uh, portions of central and eastern Kansas, um, which is going to be a focused area for this convection developing out in west central Kansas. We're forcing a centers for stronger, and we have those processes that give rise to deep convection occurring more abruptly um, compared to areas farther to the east where open warm sector sense is going to be less and going to be more, with lift being more displaced to the cool side of these boundaries we can see 
see how the boundary layer is transitioning all throughout that open uh, warm sector where we have returning moisture and becoming potentially in some areas more favored with this for um, greater surface-based effective inflow layer potential as well as surface-based convection as the texturization occurs to the background cloud structures within the moist layer. Um, and you can see even potential some evidence for these HCRs to exist across south central Kansas where we do have um, the greatest amount of reduction in static stability within the boundary layer. All right, well, we went through about over 300 slides in this presentation, so I want to thank everyone for uh, your patience as we went through this. We went through a lot of material really fast. I uh, want to thank everyone uh, for listening on this call. I want to thank the Operations Proving Ground for leading the November Go 16 workshop and preparing all the satellite images. Um, thank you so much, everyone there, for, for, for uh, putting together all this information there for Sierra, Colorado State, for some of the satellite data sets. Um, Radar imagery, I used archives from UCAR, NCAR, Mesoscale, Microscale Meteorology Laboratory. I want to thank everyone here at the National Weather Service in Topeka for, being, for all their support and for all their encouragement um, as I put this material together and getting ideas uh, from everyone here, everyone at the Storm Prediction Center for their support as well and mentoring as I learn more about satellite imagery and how we can use this to diagnose convective environments. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Dan, are you there? Yeah, do we have any questions for Ariel? Just questions or comments? Yeah, hey, Dan. It's, it's uh, Brian. Ariel, um, in terms of requesting the mesoscale sectors, have you um, done anything to facilitate that process? Uh, great question. Uh, you know, at the Storm Prediction Center, there is certainly a protocol for which the mesoscale domain sectors are requested based on the outlook category um, that effectively determines the process. I believe it is enhanced, but don't quote me on that. Um, as far as more concentrated efforts in order to request these sectors, um, and, and then of course going through our, you know, uh, whatever locations are indicated regionally. Um, I have not done a whole lot with that at all. I know there's been a lot of encouragement um, from, from region and other, otherwise in order to provide um, these requests as we need them in order to enhance the background observational information that go into IDSS. But aside from that, a more organized attempt to address the MDS, I don't have any uh, other enlightenment to provide on that. Okay, any other questions or comments? Hey, Ariel, this is uh, Pete in Jacksonville. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, hey, an area of interest of mine is uh, utilizing the higher resolution to be able to try and study boundary, uh, near circular boundary, uh, three dimensional uh, structure. Uh, one of the things we've seen in Florida, uh, one of our key boundaries in the summertime is the sea breeze, and we're able to see much better, uh, especially in rapid animation, the three dimensional structure you see lift where the convergence is and immediate descent right behind it, and we can get a sense of, of that structure, which we really couldn't see before with lower resolution imagery. I was just curious as to whether you've seen anything similar with uh, the dry line when there's convective clouds with it or with uh, pre-existing outflow boundaries. Is there any way you can utilize the higher resolution of go 16 to kind of get a, a, some sense of uh, the three-dimensional structure, depth, uh, and that type of thing? Most certainly. You know, we're certainly drawing a lot of conclusions from the implications from this. It's, 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 uh, while we're able to get some idea about depth from, say, anvil shadows, from the texture, from the depth overall of these uh, cumulus congested features along boundaries, um, the actual vertical circulation depth, it can be really tough to discern um, from just, say, visible satellite imagery alone. Um, there are certainly some of the uh, RGBs that can really help us in terms of looking at some of the air mass moisture field transitions from some of the RGBs that can kind of help with some idea about moisture convergence. Um, I have not addressed those in this particular presentation, but I strongly recommend looking at some of those RGBs, I believe air mass, um, as well as a daytime convection to look at those. But nevertheless, the way in which the Q fields are evolving relative to those boundaries, and I'm going to back up several slides, maybe 100 slides, let me actually just go back. Um, manually over here to a preceding case, we can really gauge, um, and I'm going to go to this slide over here, 
something about the vertical distribution and magnitude of the lift along these boundaries by seeing how the Q fields are behaving um, in proximity to them. This process of orphan anviling of, um, no, I made up a word, the anviling part there, I apologize for that, but um, having these repeated convective attempts that all fail beneath some capping layer, which could potentially be less of an issue, say, with as North Florida convection, you know, the Jacksonville area where you are, um, you know, it's, it's it, you know, you're not going to be necessarily dealing with as much of an EML, potentially, might have some Saharan air layer, potentially, might be equivalent to the EML, but by seeing these repeated convective attempts, um, it says something about the magnitude of the circulation, as well as the depth. Um, if it's going to have, if, if, if we're going to see a lot more successful towers, we know we're dealing with a day with a potential deeper and stronger sea breeze convergence zone related to bare clinicity than one in which we have a lot of failed attempts ongoing. Um, so really, I would say the response, aside from the RGBs of the boundary layer Q fields, is going to be critical for diagnosing the, the three-dimensional uh, structure. Does that address your question? It does. Thank you, Ariel. Fant fantastic. Thanks, Pete. This is Bernie from Syria, and I think on our end we didn't, we weren't able to see all the loops, and that might be because of GoToWebinar. So, um, are you going to make this presentation available so in case someone wants to step through it at a slower rate, they can? By all means, uh, Dan Bikos already should have all of the 370 slides or so, and um, if he wants to share that with anyone, I'm more than welcome to have that shared with anyone and everyone. Yeah, I'll make that available along with the recording. Um, are there any other questions or comments for Ariel? And feel free to email me anytime you have any questions about any of this stuff. More than happy to address it that way, too. Okay, and at this point, I'll turn it over to Brian. Yeah, th uh, thanks, Dan. Um, we just want to have a little brief uh, Q&A. If anybody has any questions about um, Go 16, uh, the products, or usage operationally, are there any questions out there? Hey, Brian, uh, this is Pete again in Jacksonville. Um, I have a comment, if that's okay. I would like to, as, as a, a member of the Sioux Stat team, I would like to push these type of webinars. Um, I know we're doing a lot of work now on, on putting together uh, uh, guides and, and briefs, um, job aids for staff on, on, on products that are available. But I don't think you can beat um, this type of application-focused uh, type training. Um, uh, and I don't know if you have any kind of, there's a plan as far as utilizing VLAB for storing or, or, the, or the store feature to, to have these uh, presentations and animations available to everyone. But I think that would be a, that would be a far greater value in my opinion than even these guides that the Sioux Stat team is actually uh, working on. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, thanks, Pete. Yeah, the uh, presentations, the webinars are recorded, and um, I think there's a we could also make additional materials related to those available. So um, that's a good point. Yeah, and I also want to ask uh, for for volunteers as well. That that really is what drives these your everybody's individual efforts to uh, lead these as well, and we really appreciate that. So so anybody has a good idea, a good case, interesting case, uh, just let uh, myself, Dan Bikus, or Scott Lindstrom know, and and uh, you can lead one of these in the future. Okay, anybody else? All right, if not, thanks, and have a good day.